Here's a simple model for an epidemic. I've got a group of infected people here, three of them. Each day there might be some new infections arising from contact with the infected pool, and each day some of the infected people might recover. On to the next day, now with four infected people. Let's invent a probability model to describe this process. Have a read. In a little bit, we'll come back to the details of this model and I'll discuss why I chose these particular random variables, the Poisson and the binomial. But first, I want to show you how this model behaves. I'm showing five different simulations here, all with exactly the same parameters. P is 7.1%, lambda is 0.079, and I've started them all at the same starting state, x0 equals 5. What I think is really fascinating here is that we have this transition between two types of behaviour. At the beginning it's all random fluctuations, and at the end it's almost perfectly deterministic, an exponential curve for four of the runs. In one of the runs, the epidemic died out completely. If we had just counted total number infected at the end, we might be tempted to look for a story about why this one had incompetent government and that one was well managed and squelched the epidemic. But in fact, the simulations all have exactly the same parameters and it's purely random chance where they end up. I find this so fascinating. We've got such different behaviours out of exactly the same model and we've got this fascinating transition from random fluctuations to deterministic growth. Here's another plot to show what effect the parameters have on the model's behaviour. For some parameters the infection is almost sure to die out, and for other parameters the exponential growth is more likely. The sorts of questions we'd like to be able to answer about models like this are how do the parameters affect the way the epidemic spreads? We know that the parameters don't determine whether the epidemic dies out or takes off, but how do they affect the probability that the epidemic dies out, and how do they affect the exponential growth rate if it does take off? These are all questions for the rest of this week's videos. But before we get onto how this sort of probability model behaves, I want to spend some more time talking about this general type of probability model and about the things we can model with them. First, some terminology. Pause the video and have a read. Basically, Whenever physicists might reach for a differential equation to model some sort of system that's changing over time, probabilists reach for random processes, and very often the first type of model they try is a Markov chain in which each state is generated based purely on the preceding state. The epidemic model we looked at a moment ago is a Markov chain. The lovely thing about Markov chains is that they're simple enough to reason about, but they're also rich enough to capture a range of interesting behaviours. We saw that with the epidemic. We saw that the same equations can sometimes behave like random variables and sometimes behave like deterministic processes. What makes Markov chains easy to reason about is this crucial property, their defining feature, that each state is generated based only on the preceding state. They're like finite state automata, which you learnt about in your first year computer science. The idea is that the state is meant to encapsulate everything that's relevant for deciding what will happen next. This is such an important property that it's worth writing it out properly. Here's how we'd write it out in maths notation. This equation says if we want to predict x n plus 1, and we know all the history from x0 up to xn, then we can throw away x0 up to xn minus 1 because they are all irrelevant. All that matters is xn. This is known as conditional independence. Informally, we'd say 
conditional on the present, the future is independent of the past. Well, what we mean is xn is the present, xn plus 1 is the future, and everything from xn minus 1 and, and earlier is the past. This property is called memorylessness. Now, memoryless random processes aren't the only game in town. There are plenty of interesting random processes that aren't Markov chains. But equally, there are plenty that are. And there are some cases where, even though it looks like we need to keep some memory, there are cunning ways to write out the model so that it is memoryless. This is a favorite trick in natural language processing, as we'll see in a later video. Okay, so the rest of this video will basically be a gallery of Markov chain models. Let's start with the most canonical of them all, a random walk on a graph. Here's a model for Cambridge weather. We've got a directed graph with three vertices, one for each type of day, either grey or drizzle or rain. And we've got a particle that jumps from vertex to vertex following the edges. Each edge is labelled with a probability, and that's the probability of following that edge. For example, if today was drizzle, then tomorrow is either grey with probability 0.7 or rain with probability 0.3. Of course, the total probability out of a vertex has to sum up to 1 for this to make sense. In code, it's very simple. We first set up a matrix of transition probabilities, call it P, and then each day we just pick the next state randomly by looking up the appropriate row of the P matrix. I've written this code using Python's yield syntax, which is Python's way of creating an infinite lazy list. To pull the next item in the list, you call next on it. Let's just introduce some terminology. This diagram at the top, showing all the states and the transitions between them, this is called the state space diagram. We refer to the set of all possible states as the state space of the Markov chain. And this matrix P with all the transition probabilities is called the transition matrix. There's a very famous application of random walks on graphs, Google's original algorithm for figuring out how to rank web pages, which they called PageRank. Imagine we have a graph with one vertex per web page, and all the edges are hyperlinked from one web page to another, and we have a random web surfer who just clicks on links at random. There'll be some pages that our surfer returns to more often, and it turns out there's a nice little piece of matrix algebra for computing this return frequency, and it's exactly this return frequency that is page rank, except for a tiny little bit of tweaking the graph to deal with the pages that have no outgoing links at all. OK, next example. This one's called a simple random walk on the integers. We start at some specified initial value, say 0, then each time step we either jump plus 1 or minus 1. The point here is we're allowed to have Markov chains with infinite state spaces. They don't just have to be finite graphs. And here's a simulation run at p equals a half. This sort of Markov chain model is used for stock prices. A jump right means the stock price goes up by some small percentage, say 0.1%, and a jump left means it goes down by 0.1%. And then the simple random walk is the basis for modelling stock options. What you might want to calculate is how high the random walk is likely to reach in a given time, and this is the basis for derivatives pricing and for the Black-Scholes formula, which won a Nobel Prize for its inventors. There are a couple more Markov chain examples in the printed notes, and I'm going to leave you to read about them. But I do just want to wrap up by returning to our epidemic model and talking about where on earth the formula comes from. The idea of data science is that you should be able to invent your own models, and so it's good to build up a repertoire of modelling design patterns. Here's our model. It has two terms one for the number of people who recover, and one for the number of new infections. Let's look at the recovery term first, the binomial with parameters xn and p. In other words, on a given day, each person recovers with probability p, 
If we look at it from the perspective of a single infected person, each day they have probability p of recovering, or in other words, the time until they recover is a geometric random variable with parameter p. And if we look up on Wikipedia to find the mean of the geometric, we learn that the average number of days until recovery is 1 on p. The other term, the term for new infections, says that the number of new infections is Poisson with parameter lambda times n. First thing to say, this is a discrete random variable, which is good because it's meant to count people and we don't want fractions of people. If we look it up on Wikipedia, we see it has mean lambda times xn. So dividing by xn, the mean number of new infections per person per day is lambda. That's per day, so if we multiply by the total length of an illness, we get lambda divided by p, the average number of infections per person over the course of their illness. And that number is what's known as the R number. It's probably more helpful if we rewrite the model using these natural parameters d and r rather than p and lambda. This is what we get. I like to write things in natural parameters whenever I can figure them out because it just makes it easier to think through how they're likely to affect the system. And here are the plots we saw earlier showing some simulation runs for a range of different parameter values. I chose different r numbers for each of the plots r equals 0.8 on the left, r equals 1 in the middle, r equals 1.2 on the right. OK, so we've seen a variety of probability models for random processes, and there are a couple more in the printed notes that you should read through. In the next video, we're going to talk about how to fit these models using maximum likelihood estimation.